on World News Tonight. Jailed and banned. The former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, barred from holding public office for five years. Back on the ball. Trump holds his first ever rally since his latest indictment, lighting up hopes of a successful election rerun. Grain gripes. Russia risks a global food emergency with obstacles on exporting its own grain in the midst of its conflict with Ukraine. And Chengdu Cham. Dreams do come true for FISU Universiad participants with the games closing while the sky is lit up. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are watching World News. We kick off tonight's rendition with some alarming updates as global food security is further put at risk with Russia's lack of ships and Western grain traders shrinking appetite for business with Moscow as the war in Ukraine spills perilously close to vital Black Sea supply routes. The observations come at a time where Russian missiles reportedly struck the center of Ukraine's Povorsk region, killing at least eight people and injuring dozens. Growing tensions in the Black Sea means Russia is feeling the crunch when it comes to moving its own wheat. The country's lack of ships has added to rising costs, while Western grain traders aren't feeling much appetite to deal with Moscow. All this at a time when the war in Ukraine has come dangerously close to key Black Sea supply routes. President Vladimir Putin promised to replace Ukrainian grain with Russian shipments to Africa last month. He did so after Moscow ended an arrangement that gave Ukraine's food cargo safe passage in the Black Sea. Russia's move put a de facto blockade on its neighbour and Moscow also attacked storage facilities. Since then, both Russia and Ukraine have warned ships destined for each other's ports could be treated as legitimate military targets. Sources said insurance for ships heading to Russia's Black Sea ports currently costs tens of thousands of dollars in additional premiums daily, with rates now ticking even higher. Industry experts say the financial and security risks associated with trading with Russia have driven up costs of freight for Moscow, and that has pushed the country toward older and smaller vessels run by less established shipping operators. Recent industry data hinted at Russia's growing hunt for vessels. Requests for charters doubled to 257 in July compared with the same month last year. The call for ships was up 40% from June and likely to climb further as the export season gathered pace. The Black Sea remains a critical area for Russian exports with other locations more complicated and costly. Russia's agriculture ministry forecast grain exports will fall about 8% during the 2023-24 season but gave no reason for the drop. The ministry in December announced a plan to build a fleet of 61 new grain ships. It did not say when they could be built by Russian shipyards. Now over in Pakistan, jailed former Prime Minister Imran Khan has been banned from holding political office for the next five years and he will lose his seat as a member of parliament. This follows an announcement by the country's election commission. Under Pakistani law, a convicted person cannot run for any public office for a period defined by the ECP. It comes days after Khan was sentenced to three years in prison for illegally selling state gifts during his tenure as Prime Minister. But Khan says the charges are politically motivated, something the government has denied. Khan's legal team has filed an appeal seeking to set aside the guilty verdict, which the Islamabad High Court will take up. The petition described the conviction as without lawful authority, tainted with bias, and said Imran Khan had not received an adequate hearing. It said the court had rejected a list of witnesses for the defence a day before reaching its verdict calling this a gross travesty of justice and a slap in the face of due process and fair trial. The court had expedited the trial after Khan refused to attend hearings despite repeated summons and arrest warrants. Unless overturned, the conviction will rule him out of contesting upcoming elections. The reaction to Khan's jailing so far has been vastly different to the outpouring of rage that followed his first arrest, even on social media with half as many Facebook posts mentioning Khan's names. The former star cricket player was elected Prime Minister in 2018 but was ousted from the position in April last year after losing a no-confidence vote. And now on to the initiatives taken to conserve the Amazon rainforest, otherwise dubbed as the lungs of the earth. Eight Amazon nations called on industrialized countries to do more to help preserve the world's largest rainforest as they met at a major summit in Brazil to chart a common course on how to combat climate change. 
Leaders of Amazon nations projected an image of unity as they met to end its deforestation. But they had failed to agree on a deadline to do just that, as their summit ended Tuesday. The countries that made up the Amazon Corporation Treaty Organization were expected to end a pact to stop deforestation by 2030, a goal Brazil itself had adopted. Instead, members were left to pursue their own individual deforestation goals. A Brazilian government source taught Bolivia was a holdout in the issue. Tensions also emerged on the issue of oil drilling. Colombia's president was against new oil developments in the Amazon, but Brazil's energy minister said they wanted to explore a huge new offshore oil find near the mouth of the Amazon River, what he said was the last frontier of oil and gas, before making a gradual energy transition. Speaking to the media, Brazil's foreign minister Mauro Vera played down the division between Colombia and other members. We do not have a different position. The position is convergent and each country will have to follow a pace that is within its reach. There are many countries in the world that still have an energy system totally dependent on coal and fossil fuels, obviously. They will be further away, but that doesn't mean they are against it, I assume. The meeting in the city of Belém brought together the members for the first time in 14 years. And out in the streets, it also gathered indigenous peoples of the Amazon who marched against mining, oil drilling and other so-called extractivist projects. We are here marching and saying that we do not accept mining in our territory. We do not want oil exploitation in the Amazon. That this has already impacted the lives of our families in our territories. The Bellum Summit also did not fix a deadline on ending another threat to the forest, illegal gold mining. However, leaders agreed to cooperate on the issue and work together to police cross-border environmental crimes. The final joint statement called the Bellum Declaration strongly asserted indigenous rights and protections and agreements on negotiating positions at climate summits. But without a strong statement vowing zero deforestation, critics say policymakers are moving too slowly to head off catastrophic global warming as temperatures soar to record levels globally. And now over in Japan, Typhoon Kanun is already leaving scars, putting public transport on hold in the southern island of Kyushu. To get exact information on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent, Anjali Vijayaratna from Fukuoka in Japan on the field with the latest updates. Anjali, over to you. Yes, I'm ready. As you can see, the wind is gushing in right now as well behind me and the scent seems like it will calm down anytime soon. We are literally bracing ourselves for more impact here. According to the Japan's weather authorities, Typhoon Kanun is over the sea, 110 kilometers southwest of Kagoshima Prefecture as of today and is slowly moving northwest. Up to 300 millimeters of heavy rain is forecasted in the region along with strong wind as a result, J.R. Kyushu Railway Company has also stopped the operations of its Shinkansen bullet trains between Kumamoto and Kagoshima. Dozens of bus services and flights also have been cancelled due, due to this. Kanun could make landfall on the south southwestern main island of Kyushu, some 858 kilometers from Tokyo, on Thursday, but areas of the region have already been inundated with a whole month's worth of rainfall in the past week. The storm is currently in the sea south of Kyushu after wreaking havoc in the southwestern Okinawa region. The JMA issued heavy rain and high winds, a warning to many parts of southern and western Japan. The storm is forecast to head towards the Korean Peninsula in the coming days as a second storm land formed in the Pacific Ocean south of Japan and was predicted to strengthen as it heads north, possibly affecting Tokyo early the next week. Back to you, Anrali. All right, thank you, Anjali, for that update, and please do stay safe. All right, that was other than a World News Special Correspondent, Anjali Vijayaratna, reporting from Fukuoka in Japan. Now, it seems there is no military intervention on the horizon for Niger, as Nigerian President and current ECOWAS Chair Bola Tinubu said that diplomacy is the best way forward to resolve the crisis in Kuhit, Niger. The statement came after the junta in Niamey said it could not host a mission from the West African bloc for security reasons. Despite the intransigence of Niger's military leaders, the U.S. said diplomacy was the preferred way of pushing them to reverse the coup. 
as they threatened to cut hundreds of millions of dollars in military assistance and aid to the country. We, like other countries, are trying to use diplomacy to ensure that constitutional order is restored. The interruption of this constitutional order puts us and many other countries in a position where we have to stop our aid, our support, and this will not benefit the people of Niger. The U.S. says it spent around $500 million since 2012 to help boost security in Niger. Washington and its allies consider the country to be at the center of efforts to fight terrorist organizations in the region. It's estimated the United States has around 1,100 troops in the country, stationed across two bases, as well as an outpost just outside Niamey, with their primary mission training and supporting local Nigerian forces. But a question mark hangs over the U.S. troops' continued presence. Washington fears that if it withdraws, Niger, following in the footsteps of several of its neighbors, will turn to Russia and its Wagner mercenaries. But current U.S. efforts to negotiate with Niger's coup leaders have proved futile so far. After meeting with them on Monday, the second-ranking U.S. diplomat, Victoria Newland described talks as, quote, at times quite difficult. She said the military leaders refused to allow her to meet with deposed President Bazoum and said they were unreceptive to her appeals to start negotiations and restore constitutional rule. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now moving on to the UK where six British water companies are facing lawsuits valued at over £800 million brought on behalf of millions of customers for allegedly overcharging customers by under-reporting sewage discharges. How clean are our rivers? It's a question which is becoming increasingly important both environmentally and politically and one which might be answered if a series of legal claims against six UK water companies are successful. The claims, led by class representative Professor Carolyn Roberts, aim to prove that the companies have broken competition laws by under-reporting the number of sewage spills into waterways. They've been reporting, for the most part, that they have hit those targets and therefore they've been charging their customers more than otherwise would have been the case. Our allegation is that, in fact, they've been seriously under-reporting the extent of their, uh, the number of their spills and therefore charging their customers too much. The six companies involved, though, say the argument simply doesn't hold water. The first claim, brought on behalf of 8 million people against 7 Trent Water, is estimated to be worth more than £330 million. The company says it consistently delivers for its customers and recently received the highest four-star status for environmental performance from the Environment Agency. That's despite discharging 45,000 times into waterways across their region last year. That totals 250,000 hours of raw, untreated sewage being poured into waterways. And so it's disgusting to think that they're being rewarded for environmental performance already. And this, even without this claim, is quite disgusting. If this stage of the legal action is successful, the campaigners hope it will force the water companies to release all their data relating to sewage discharges. Data which they believe will show that customers are due compensation and that more enforcement is necessary to keep our rivers clean. to tonight's Road to the White House segment as Trump holds first rally since his latest indictment. Defiant now more so than ever, the former president attacked special counsel Jack Smith and called the criminal investigation into interference in the 2020 election a ridiculous case that is targeting his First Amendment right. Tonight, former President Trump holding his first campaign rally since his latest indictment on election interference. Today, blasting how much he's tied up in legal battles. I'm sorry, I won't be able to go to Iowa today. I won't be able to go to New Hampshire today because I'm sitting in a courtroom on Trump rallying his supporters in early voting state New Hampshire, lashing out at special counsel Jack Smith's request for a protective order, which would bar him from discussing some elements of the case. I will talk about it. I will. They're not taking away my First Amendment. Right. 
the former president growing even more defiant. Well, every time you get indicted, I like to check the polls because... <laughs> one more indictment that I think this election's over. Attacking one of his most vocal critics in the GOP field, Chris Christie. I know Christie's he's eating right now. He can't be bothered. Sir, please do not call him a fat pig. Trump's rally coming amid a major shakeup for his chief rival, Ron DeSantis. The Florida governor replacing his campaign manager, Janera Peck, bringing in James Oopmeyer, his longtime chief of staff in the governor's office. DeSantis rebooting his campaign after weeks of headlines showing a presidential run in disarray. And today, the major announcement from another Trump ally turned rival. Former Vice President Mike Pence saying he has met the 40,000 donor threshold to participate in this month's Republican primary debate. I think the American people want to see the, the most experienced and proven conservative on that stage. Participants of the World Scout Jamboree are now making themselves comfortable in their new homes after evacuating from San Mangum over typhoon fears. Let's take a look. A bus arrives and scouts from Bulgaria disembark. They left the Semangum campsite earlier in the day, bound for Sejong City. After a brief welcome ceremony at City Hall, a commemorative photo is taken in front of the statue of King Sejong the Great. Before checking out other cultural activities, the scout members enjoy a nice Korean meal. Although I'm not very used to spicy food, it, I, it is quite uh, welcoming. I really enjoy it. After spending most of the World Scout Jamboree in the intense heat, scout members are enjoying fun cultural activities indoors where it's nice and cool. And there's a wide range of activities the scouts can enjoy, whether it be indoor rock climbing, creating figurines using a 3D pen, or even learning to make popular Korean dishes like dakboki. But here in Sejong city, it's really nice. Really like it. All of the kids are experiencing very nice things here. So thank you for your really nice accommodating us here. After leaving Semangum, some 10,000 scouts arrived in the Chungcheongdo province region. They will be staying in dormitories, temples, and corporate training centers, away from the intense heat and the typhoon that's headed towards Korea. It's nice, cool, comfortable, and I'm really happy with this place. It's, I'm thankful for staying here. It's amazing. I finally get to rest my back a bit. And potentially, a highlight for many of the young scouts is the upcoming K-pop concert that will now go ahead at the Seoul World Cup Stadium this Friday. According to the Culture Ministry on Tuesday, the decision to move the concert from Jeonju World Cup Stadium was made with the stadium's proximity to the Jamboree participants' new accommodation and security in mind. The Seoul World Cup Stadium will host both the K-pop concert and the closing ceremony, with some of the biggest K-pop artists scheduled to perform. We have some good news for you. We might have found a way to alleviate the woes of climate change as the arrival of commercially available genetics to produce dairy cattle that emit less methane could help reduce one of the biggest sources of the potent greenhouse gas. Could breeding be one way to get cows to release less methane? Some scientists and industry experts think so. A genetics company is selling bull semen with a low methane trait. Methane is the second biggest greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide. Cattle release it when they burp. So could genetics help them belch less of it? Livestock make up more than 14% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. One University of Guelph estimate suggests Canadian dairy cows release up to 1.7 pounds of methane a day. To cope, New Zealand for one will start taxing farmers for cattle methane in 2025. In Canada, the low methane breeding material is a product of genetics company CMEX, the country's milk recording agency, and is based on research by Canadian scientists. CMEX is using the trait could bring down methane emissions from Canada's dairy herd by 1.5% annually, and that by 2050, that figure could jump as high as 30%. It says dairy farmers in Canada, Britain, the US, and Slovakia are trying it out. But not everyone is convinced this is the way to go. 
Some industry officials worry if cattle burp less, they could have digestion issues. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Iran Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Dolhain called for a collaboration between Iran and BRICS countries. He highlighted that Iran's geopolitical location, energy resources and young skilled workforce as strengths that contribute to it being a reliable and effective partner in bilateral and multilateral cooperation. Thousands of Los Angeles municipal workers walked off their job for a 24-hour strike demanding higher wages and alleging unfair labor practices. A water spot that turned into a tornado on land lashed the coastal city of San Remo in northwestern Italy causing damage to property. The whirling water spout was filmed wreaking havoc. It moved inland towards the city quickly where it damaged roofs and vehicles within minutes. Last month was the hottest July on record with abnormally high temperatures recorded on both land and sea as per the European Union's Copernicus Climate Change Panel. The International Whaling Commission said it had issued an extinction alert for the endangered Vaquita porpoise, whose population is estimated to have shrunk to less than a dozen, marking the institution's first ever extinction warning. And that is all we have for you on World News tonight. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Now we leave you tonight in China as fireworks burst into the sky in the form of the sun and immortal birds with the 31st FISU World University Games closing with a bang. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.